I want to tell you a story about this fountain over here. Um, in high school, I got to be a part of this video productions program uh, that I feel very blessed to have been a part of. It was extremely robust, starting you off in like a video one program that was very small, uh, very small in scope, touch of the basics, rule of thirds, framing, close up, medium shot, wide shot, establishing shot, uh, how to use music, how to make a music video, how to edit, how to use the basic tools, how to use iMovie, how to use a camera, exposure, shutter speed, all of the, the basics, the fundamentals of film. And brought itself all the way up through live broadcasts, all the way up through uh, video productions, all the way up through uh, a feature film, basically. And there was just this wide swath and this passion for movie making in that school that I haven't really been able to tap into in a scale as big as that school ever since, just because it's not the actual world that I spend most of my time in, which is usually tech and education. But what was really fun is that I got to be a part of that feature film uh, group. I got to make a movie and got to direct and be the director of photography for two separate feature films that were written by the school, that were produced by the school, and that were created entirely by the students and completely self-organized by the students with just a little bit of supervision by the teacher. And it was quite a profound experience for me. I got to really have my hand and see how my work day to day, one hour, one period at a time over the course of a semester, and then in the editing booth for, again, one hour at a time, one period at a time for the course of a second semester, led to this end of year product that I got to show to the entire school and got to see how the film created or didn't create a reaction in the audience. And one of the things that I didn't know at the time was how to use those fundamentals of videography well. And I didn't know how much those fundamentals were built up through the course of the history of film over a longer period of time. And so as I got older, I graduated high school, I got to make my two feature films, and I went into college. And in college, I got to take a couple of uh, electives about filmmaking and about the history of cinema. And there is where I really learned kind of those fundamentals and how they developed. Now, in that class, which was about the golden era and the history of directors in the golden era of film, I learned a lot about auteur theory. I learned a lot about um, the history of the early days of the patent wars of cinema. I learned a lot about the blacklist. I learned a lot about how Vertical integration in the Hollywood era was the same, fought the same battles that we see in the tech world today. And most importantly, I learned how to deconstruct film in a more robust way because I had done it myself and now I was learning it from the greats. And so ever since then, I spent a lot of time away from making movies, which was kind of very unfortunate. I'd spent a lot of my youth practicing making films, and I spent a lot of kind of my young adulthood learning how great films were made. And what I didn't get to do was marry the two, until now. Now, I tell you this story with the relation to this fountain, because in one of the feature films that I made, uh, at the very end, the last shot we shot, the last shot of the film is a symbolic measure where someone throws their red jacket into the fountain and it drifts away representing a change uh, from one person to another, a new era for that person, a new, uh, um, a new identity. We tried to fetch that uh, hoodie from the fountain and uh, we, we tried our best to fish it out and it just kept drifting away. And, um, we did it because it was such an important symbol for the movie. Now, looking back on all of that, I wish that I had known what I knew now about the basics of videography. How to use a close-up. How to portray um, scenes and emotions with the camera itself. And I wish I would have known how the history of film led us to develop a language of film and videography um, such that I could have used it in those feature films in that last shot that was supposed to be very emotional uh, which ultimately when I when push came to shove it didn't land as well as I wanted it to as a high schooler 
And so I know I'm all over the place, but this is all to say that there is a language to film, right? And I don't mean the actual verbal language of a scene. Some books are turned into movies and they just feel like books. You've just taken scenes out of a book and turned them into a movie. But some movies speak the language of film itself and take what is unique about film and use what is unique about film to tell a story in its own right. They use visual storytelling and action and camera movement and the language of, uh, um, of depth of field and the close-ups and the long shots and framing and color and music all combined together to make some of the most compelling stories that you could possibly tell on a screen. But it wasn't always that way. In fact, early on in film, a video camera was basically a stand-in for someone in an audience, and then there was a play behind, and it was pretty much all locked down on a tripod, and uh, a scene of a play basically played out with instantaneous set changes. And so, in the early days of film, we did not know what the language of film was going to be that had to develop over decades, if not a century, of filmmaking, and it continues to develop to this day. There were very unique things, actually, in those early stages, which were that we found out that cameras could move. A camera could become a character in the film itself. That different focal lengths led to different feelings, right? That breaking the fourth wall looked different on a stage than it did in a movie. And that editing could just lengthen or shorten sequences such that you could play with time and space in a way that a traditional theater play had much harder time to do. And that brings us to today, where Apple Vision Pro has been released, AR and VR and mixed reality is something that is definitely going to be a part of our future. And that means that with that technological shift, there will be new art forms that come out of it. This has always been the case of, uh, of film at the very least, but of all art really. And Apple having released Submerged, a, their first narrative film in Apple, I think, forget what it's called, Apple Immersive Video, I think, shows us how the early stages of a new film format affect what is possible in a storytelling technique. Now, Apple hired Edward Berger, who is known for All Quiet on the Western Front. I think that is at least Oscar nominated, if not Oscar winning film uh, about World War I. And it's set in a very similar setting, only this time it's set in a submarine. And the question I had going in from a filmmaker's perspective is, what is Edward Berger gonna do with this new format that was impossible with film before? And will he take what is great about immersive videography and apply it in a way that uh, breaks new ground? And I think after watching it, the answer is clearly yes. Not my favorite video, not my favorite movie, not my favorite story of all time, but there are certain moments in that movie which kind of show you the vector or the direction that we will head with, with this new film technology. And to me, that is really quite exciting. So they've added a few, right? They've added like a travel one, they've added sports ones. One of the first ones was like an MLS thing, one, which I thought was awesome actually. Mm. Um, it was just a recap, I think of the world is this one? No, of the, no, it was MLS. So one, it was of one of the Apple designed fans. ones, or is this just a video? Yeah, these are the same cameras that you saw the Alicia Keys things. Oh, with, I want to see right? that. Yeah, I'll, I'll show you the sports one. And they have one for the Super Bowl too, actually, which was really cool. Oh. Um, and they show you like the celebration afterwards. You get to be in the in the the That's room cool. with them and stuff like that. Uh, and I hear that they're doing an NBA one too, but I, I don't know for mm. sure. Um, but nothing narrative, mm. and really modest. Right. And actually one of the complaints that people had that I didn't necessarily agree with in the first round was that like when you were watching the sports highlights, it makes sense to do these quick cuts all the time, right? In like a traditional sense. But when you are kind of taking in the entirety of like a sports event, like a stadium, you're imagining yourself like looking around and things like that. And like the quick cuts make it so that you can't take the appropriate things in. It like makes more sense for like really long stationary shots because there's just so much information for you yeah. to explore in any given thing. And so I remember hearing like little rumors about this narrative version. Mm -hmm. And immediately my first thought was like, what is a filmmaker going to do with the format? Because it's very different filming something live versus something that is supposed to be scripted, 
right? Especially in narrative story, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's what you saw. It was mm -hmm. their first narrative film made for Apple Vision Pro using, I forget what it's called, like Apple Immersive Video, I think is the name of, oh, their, okay. of their, their content. Yeah. And the entirety of that is basically like the cameras, the special cameras that they've designed to create this format. It's like 180 degree field of view, mm -hmm. approximately. And um, I think that's basically the extent of it. And there's some like resolution guarantees, I think, as well. And mm -hmm. so um, I'm curious, like what you, we talked a little bit about it before after you watched it, but like what was your initial reaction like watching it? Um, I mean, I don't know. I'm thinking about watching the beginning of it, right? Yeah. Like it. No, like, let's just talk about the opening shot, actually. Well, is the, was the opening shot, that was in the bunk no, it board, was actually right? was in the water, point? and then the submarine comes over the top oh, of you. Oh my gosh! Yeah. yeah. And I noticed one thing that you did is you actually looked up right yeah. away. Yeah. Yeah, I remember like I like looked like this. Yeah. And then I was looking side to side. Um, yeah, I, I agree with what you're saying just generally about it having those. How do I say this? Like, when you have those like static shots, right, where you're like the camera doesn't move yeah. in the way that like you are trying to say the person who is watching it you are still yeah and, and the things are moving around you right this thing is coming in over your head yeah, yeah. like it would actually happen if it was coming over my head yeah, right? yeah. um that felt very realistic uh and i'm thinking about like we, we watched the other movie for comparison right yeah and uh, well, just for, for context, right? So this this narrative short film, mm -hmm. scripted film by Apple, I believe they hired Edward Berger to oh, direct it. Oh, was both were Edward Berger? Yeah, so oh, he, okay. he is a Hollywood director. I think he he's Oscar nominated. I don't know that he won any Oscars. Uh, his most recent was, I think, a uh, movie for Netflix called All Quiet on the Western Front. And so you watched that. Well, actually, I watched Submerged, which was the Apple film. You watched Submerged. And then we watched All Quiet on the Western Front just on a classic TV to kind of com like do a cross comparison. But you were saying afterwards. Yeah, but I felt like I felt like in a classic movie and you could notice it in All Quiet on the Western Front as well in comparison to what Submerged was doing. Submerged in that original shot where the submarine, the submarine like comes from over your head like <laughs> this. And then it, it happens again, I think, in uh, there's this hallway scene Yeah. where he's coming there's a there's like a a protagonist Navy yeah sailor whatever yeah. submarine guy yeah and he comes down the hallway and because he's looking for his friend that's somewhere else on the ship yeah and so he's like walking down the hallway and the way that the camera is set up like you are you are like at the you are at the a fork in the hallway mm -hmm. path so like there's he's coming down one hallway in front of you but you can see down the hallway in this direction, mm -hmm. and he can't, right? That's right. Yeah. And that to me was oh, actually that was one of the most like, Some, like oh, dramatic this is, irony this is, is different. What's happening there. You know what is I mean? That what that's Because um, I think you could have accomplished that on a regular TV, but it, it it would not have had the 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 gravity that this one did. Because you were choosing to look that. Because direction. you were choosing to look. Because yeah. normally it's like you would have to zoom out enough. Right, that yeah. you could see down both hallways, which I, I'm sure that they have in other movies, like maybe Inception or something like that, where like you're in a hallway and you see a character here, but you also can see here. You, that can happen, but it's not. You don't feel like you're in the hallway. You're just like, oh, this is a wide shot. Yeah. Whereas like in that one, like the way that they had it was like if you look and the, the whole thing, it's like you look at something. It looked it worked, and I said this to you after I watched it. It worked the way that vision works. Yeah. Where like I'm looking at you right now, and everything else over here is like sort of blurry yeah. but if I wanted to look you know over here and I can see there's people scootering over there if I wanted to go focus on them I can yeah. but when I'm looking at you I know that it's happening there but I'm not looking at it well let, let me back up a little bit so and that first shot I think it, it was, I was very interested that you looked up because I did the same thing when I yeah. first watched it right yeah and I think that it was a very like I'll be honest like the film overall I thought it was like okay like it was not like very like I, I mean was it was not like super a short engaged. it was like you know. I, I, I've been very engaged in shorts before, but like actually after watching All Quiet on the Western Front, I was like sort of the same level engaged. I just think that Edward Berger is not my style of director. Like he doesn't make the type of stories well, and films that, that are like He would do super... something, he'd go, you go, yeah, Edward Berger loves this. <laughs> well, I was just noticing the parallels because yeah, I, I haven't yeah. really watched his films before, right? Yeah. And so, uh, and I like doing that autobiograph or the biographical kind of criticism of yeah. a film, right? For auteur theory. But the point is that 
there are, he does have a very good understanding of the medium, and which is uh, something I noticed when we watched the All, All Quiet on the Western Front, like as a movie, like he did not, we, you and I have talked about watching movies in the past that feel like books. You take a book and you like put it on the screen and there hasn't been a lot of thought about how you went from one medium to the other, right? It's like you turned it into a script that had a lot of the same dialogue and then you film like mm -hmm. shot versus shot, wide angle, and mm -hmm. then looks like standard coverage and like you, it's just sort of like, you're just filming like little scenes of conversation, right? Mm -hmm. There's a lot in like All Quiet on the Western Front, for example, where Edward Berger goes and he's like showing Tracing, you talked about like Sisterhood of the Traveling Pants, right? Showing the meaning of this clothing or of this dog tag or of this label, right? Yeah. That is not explained anywhere, but you as the viewer understand what's happening yeah. because you're like, oh, we were invested in this character at the beginning and then something happened to them and then I now know the meaning behind this prop, basically, right? Mm -hmm. And then the prop is shown in a particular way with the camera such that it doesn't need to be explained because you just get it, yeah. right? And so he understands the language of film rather than the language of text, right? And so that opening shot of Submerged shows that he had some intention, I think, of like understanding what this medium was doing as well, which I really appreciated about it, right? Like, oh, think about yeah. it. You could have, oh, he totally. could have just said it so that the submarine was right in front of you at the beginning. And well, you would have just okay, looked at it. You know what I like, think okay, is actually good? Kind of interesting. A good a comparison there is the tank in All Quiet on the Western Front yeah, yeah. versus the submarine sure, shot. Yeah. Because you have, to, you, you the, the communication that we were trying to get for both of them is look at how huge this thing is. Yeah, so basically. just for context again, on, in All sure. Quiet on the Western Front, yeah. there's a battle scene, there are tanks that roll up and you just, you see... You are, from the point of view of a soldier who is underneath the tank that's going over yes. a trench. Yes, but because it's a picture, basically, right, you have one shot, maybe it's no, a shaky no, shot. No, it wasn't one shot though. It was multiple shots. Yeah. He had to use multiple shots to communicate the same thing. So like he had a shot from underneath yeah. inside the trenches. He had shots from above. He had shots from the side. Well, what and do you, you think were was watching being communicated there? That, the tr that, that these tanks were uh, like a massive formidable machines. force, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. It was like, oh, there's this huge thing that like, they had kind of like in that, in that point in like the battle scene, they, you know, they, they were, they were like, shooting at each other yeah how they do and then like okay it felt like we like were this. we were like one v one matched yeah and they were kind of like, like able, soldier versus tank. soldier versus yeah well it yeah. was soldier versus soldier and things were matched and then yeah. suddenly the tanks came in and yeah. we even talked about it in real time when we were watching it we were like oh like how much earlier were tanks invented like <laughs> yeah. this was the tank was yeah. a pretty new I, I think new invention i don't know when tanks were invented were invented exactly but um i'm curious to know that now but uh <laughs> Tanks were relatively new, yeah. and so oh. it, it felt like in that moment, the soldiers were going, oh my god, we're outmatched. Yeah. Like, this is... Yeah, we don't know what to do. We don't know what to do. How, like, how do we even... And they kind of figured it out. They put but the, the, the gas things in whatever. the point of what you're trying to say is that they, in, in All Quiet on the Western Front, he was actually... It's, it's interesting, because you can go one way or the other. Like, he was given the ability to take multiple shots. I don't think it was necessary to have multiple shots. Like you could have just had it going the over tank. the trench. Yeah. Yes. But he, he was able to, but to the point about the you cuts. You don't need the, to in the uh, other one. I don't think you need to in either, in my opinion. But mm -hmm. what I'm saying is that you actually do need to, in, in Submerge, have one angle yeah. and choose that angle mindfully. And actually him playing into the the, nece the necessity well, to look up to watch it. You know it. That, the, that the person who is watching it yeah. will do that for you. Exactly. They and will go, oh my God. And because it, it, um, yeah. it almost filled the entire screen when it was above you. Yeah. And so it just, it was like, it was like a shortcut almost. Like you didn't need all of these shots to communicate the largeness yeah. of this thing. Again, I don't think you need all the shots in the other one. Sure. I think you have it flipped. That's just my opinion though. No, like, but. Just as, as someone who has <laughs> been making movies for a long time, I think it would have been just as meaningful to have a single shot of a tank coming over. But my point is that in Submerged, he didn't actually not have the liberty to show multiple shots of the submarine necessarily, right? Because like we talked about, when I was watching the, uh, the soccer highlights reel, the quick cuts actually made it hard to process all the information, right? And mm -hmm. so him opening to this big blue vast ocean, right? 
he could have like cut to 18 different angles of the of the submarine if he wanted to, right? But it would have been hard to take everything in. And so for this, him making you tilt your head up actually gets you invested very quickly. Whereas the tanks, on the other hand, right, you could have had it such that if like one shot, and you you can imagine like this haze, and there's these, it's like you said, man on man at first, and then out of the haze comes the tanks, and it would have communicated kind of the same message, right? But he actually had the ability in that movie to show the man on man combat, and then show the tanks coming in, and then from a different angle, show it rolling over the trenches, and it would be it, it communicated. Something yes, like that. I agree, but I also disagree yeah. because I think, I mean, or it would have been extremely difficult to get a shot. Okay, so for example, okay, you're you're a character, you're you're a soldier in the trenches, yeah. and this tank is coming over you. Yeah. You would have basically, I mean, I and I remember, I can I can imagine this one shot of the tank going over. Yeah. And you could see. I mean, you could see the, the wheels churning above you. Yeah. And that was when we were like, oh my God, I can't believe that that tank is so big that it is not even stopped by the trenches, right? Like it just like rolls right on top. But if you, if you are actually giving a, a like life size, I'm a person and here is my size compared to this thing. Yeah. If you tried to do a shot like that oh, of the tank, the tank would fill the whole screen. You would not be able to do a, compa a size comparison of the tank compared to the size of the trench or the sky or whatever. In this one with Submerge, he could communicate all of that in one shot because you have the person here and you're able to make this, without it just being a hugely wide shot, you could have the, 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 sub the submarine above yeah. you, but then you can also see because the screen is so huge, I mean yeah. huger than you would have, for a regular movie, well, actually, it feels like yeah. your your vision of the movie is like from here. What you're to describing here. is a sense of scale, which is not able, which is not the same, which cannot be communicated the same in film as what you're saying with a single shot, right? I think yeah. you can through through comparison, but not in the same way as if you were there. Because but like you could see the vastness of the ocean around the submarine, yeah. so you could still see there's a whole lot of ocean. Yeah. But this thing is so much bigger than me. Yeah. And I don't think that. It would, have, it would have been very difficult for him to, to do something like that with the tank because the tank would have just filled the whole shot. Yeah, and I think that you're, you're right in the sense that, it, from a, because it's interesting, really in a VR headset, if you're watching a movie, everything is point of view for yeah. you. There's all, like everything, like you are an observer who's present, but like invisible and watching everything, and you actually have control and agency over it. There's probably a lot to learn from video games, actually, in the way video games do storytelling. Oh, totally. And, and I wouldn't know that very much because I've never played very many video games in my life, right? But, That's what I'm the most curious about with, with Apple Vision, with, with the stuff that they're doing, is like I have not seen a lot of like actual video game where you are a character in the video game in that way. There are some. Uh, but, like, like The Last of Us, I would like to see that. Yeah. MetaQuest does that way better. And, and I would does. be curious to see, yeah, and, and I haven't used MetaQuest before, so I don't really know how yeah. that, what that looks like. Anyways. I'm, I'm more interested in it from a filmmaking perspective, right? Yeah. Because so much of film is about how you direct attention, right? Like, you talk about like, you know how like when you have a shot and there's something in the foreground and then the background is all blurry, right? They call that depth of field or, or like, uh, or bokeh or, or like your, your focus, right? And things like that. And that is one way of directing attention in this. There was some of that actually in this film, right? In submerged? In submerged. And so like you open with that shot of the submarine coming over you and then you're right, you go into the cabin and I think that they start with some close-ups of the details of the, of the shots. And there's, there was two things I noticed. The first one was in relation to the scale that you were talking about. I think that there was two different focal lengths that they used for their lenses. So they had a one which was sort of like life size, which was like is what you were talking about. We opened up and you could see the scale of the submarine because it was like your eyes were actually seeing. It's like you were actually underwater, right? And then there's this other lens, and maybe there was more than one, where that was zoomed. And you could actually see things with more detail. And it kind of felt like you, if you really pay attention when you watch it, it kind of feels like they've, you've shrunk down to be a smaller like ant or something like that. And you're looking at like this like wheel, for example, that's dripping down, right? Mm -hmm. The other piece of that shot was this shallow depth of field which felt weird to me in that case. Both of those things felt weird to me. And when you zoom in, I'm like, oh my God, I've just shrunk and become like a small person all of a sudden, like very tiny, like a quarter of my size, right? I'm looking at this gigantic wheel, right? Mm. And then at the same time, also, I can't pan my focus and look over here, right? Because it's all blurred out, because it has a shallow depth of field, which I is not I don't even remember that, to be honest with you. So like, that I was- That part like, did not- 
which is interesting because like you and I obviously are gonna have different focuses when it comes yeah. to that. But that was one of the things. So like well, it messes with you. You can really mess with your sense of scale in that because of it. And I don't know that I liked the shallow depth of field in this, where in like a movie it feels necessary because you are doing so much attention directing. So, but what were you gonna that's say? That's so funny. I feel like I was actually about to say almost the opposite. Oh yeah, what was which it? Which is that I felt like Submerged was more of a like choose your own adventure than All Quiet on the Western Front. In what way? In that, like, okay, the hallway scene yeah. or the bunker scene yeah. or the, um, I would say maybe the, the scenes where it was like a, um, it was more exposition. You were just sort of like seeing the ship for the first time. Mm -hmm. Ones like that rather than like when it got into the action of it all. Because then it was like you were so pulled in by the action. You're not doing really yeah, you're a just lot. Following you're action. just following what's going yeah. on. But like in the moments where like, the bunker scene is a good example where like you're you're in you're starting sort of like further out of the bunker yeah and then this it's moving forward as though you're walking through the room yeah right until it gets to kind of more of a close-up on the main character yeah. and, the, and the two men that are about to start talking when that was happening i was like oh my god i realized i can look around <laughs> so then i'm like looking to the side oh i totally agree and i you. was like oh my god i can see the so like when That's I looked, opening shot when I, yeah, like when yeah. I looked straight on, I'm seeing the two men that they want me to focus on. Yes. But I don't actually have to look there. Yeah, I agree. I can look over here at this man and I can see the sweat on his cheeks. And then I can also look over here and I can read the barcode on the side of the bunker or I whatever agree it is. I agree 100%. Right? I'm saying that there are certain well, shots in the movie where that is not the case. And I did not like the shots where that was not the case. I prefer the ones that you're I know, but I'm about. saying there's almost no times where that is the truth for All Quiet on the Western Front. All Quiet on the Western Front, they have complete yeah. control over where you, yes. what you see and exactly. what your attention looks like. Yeah, and I think so, that that's the difference between this uh, classical film and this. And this is probably this. coming from, I don't use Apple Vision Pro like you do. So you have maybe a little bit more of a, like, um, you're like, I, I want that to be the case all the time. Like, I want to always have control because if, yeah. if it's if it's in this thing. I think you and I are saying the same thing. Well, yes, but I'm saying I'm still in awe of the fact that that is even a reality. Oh, me too. I didn't even know that you could have that. Yeah. But yes, I, I mean, I, it would have been cool to have it for the whole time, but I, I don't know. It's like, I can understand for the, for the moments where it was really action-based why they didn't do that. Why because, they didn't do what? Why they didn't, uh, uh, like, why it was a little bit blurred out maybe in p other parts. No, during the action stuff it wasn't. I'm talking about just a couple of shots early on when they're just setting the scene, right? I don't know if I remember those, so, like, so it's what, hard for me to What I remember them. is you have that over-the-head shot with the, um, yeah. with the submarine coming in, right? Yeah. And that was a perfect example of what you're talking about, where yeah. like, you could have just kept looking at the ocean, but actually the director, through very clever blocking and editing, right, kind of almost forces you to look up. Like that's, yeah. a, that's a very interesting use of, of the medium, yeah. right? And then immediately you're inside of the actual submarine, right? And they're showing like, for example, a very close up shot of like, I, I know this is not what happened in the thing, but like they showed a close up shot of the phone, right? Literally zoomed in. Or, I don't, what the, I'm saying is I don't know. I, what, yeah. did they, what did they zoom in on, do you remember? It was a wheel and then like, I think maybe some Outside the, the bunker panels. room? It was just inside the submarine, just random things oh. inside the submarine. And then there was like another, probably the most notable, noticeable one was the shot of the bug crawling into the grate. Do you remember that shot? Oh yeah, I like that one. So that was a zoomed in shot, Yeah. right? And, and it made you feel like you were almost like the size of the bug, actually, right? And then everything oh, was blurred out around. Saying. And so like if you look in the back, you can't really see much. But there's probably, I mean, I could count those shots on, le on a hand basically, right? Whereas the number of the other shots are probably like 20 or 30, maybe 40, right? Uh, and those were all more like that opening shot where I agree with you 100%. You get to choose where you're looking ultimately, right? And there are certain things that a director can do to draw your attention in certain places. And because of that, I actually think that it felt a lot more like watching a stage play than like watching a movie. Oh, right? interesting. So if you think about like a stage play, right? A director in those things does not get to mess with your sense of time that much, right? They don't really get to mess with your sense of scale that much, right? And they don't really get to control your focus other than through very clever uses of blocking on the set, right? Mm -hmm. And maybe lighting or props, mm -hmm. right? And, and action too. Action is a big piece of that, right? And I think they call that focus in, in stage plays, right? But I think about like going to Broadway and watching like Hamilton, right? And you'll have like this big spotlight shot. And like that is how you're, they're directing your focus, not by cutting to the person's reaction really closely, right? And just knowing a little bit about the history of film, the early days of film, they were like, oh, well, what do we do with this? It's just a window into a stage play. And they would just have a stationary shot and they would do an entire stage play basically. 
act it out, and then they might move on to another scene and basically have an instantaneous set change, right? And then over time, the language of film developed into the type of thing that Edward Berger was using in the Western, and all, all quiet on the Western front, where it was like, okay, you could have this close up, and then you've got this thing, and a pan shot means something, and like the language of a war film means something, right? Like mm -hmm. that was a grammar that developed over 100, over 100 years, right? This is a new grammar, which is, it, which to me feels like it's calling back to a very old grammar, right? So you because think you would prefer for them to just move into this new language rather than trying to hold on to stuff like, like that bug shot. That's a good example yeah. of like, I, you know, it's funny. I think that I disagree with you <laughs> in terms of I liked it in the way that... I don't know why you think I don't like these. I'm saying that I thought it was an interesting thing and it made me feel weird in those cases because okay. I felt like I was normal size and I was small size. I'm saying I liked it because it made me feel superhuman almost. Oh, interesting, yeah. Like, like, and all of it felt superhuman. Yeah. It felt like you were, it felt like, like, and maybe I'm, maybe I'm just very scatterbrained a little <laughs> bit, but like, when I watch a normal movie, I'm like, they tell me where to look, and I look there, and I go like, oh, that's cool, you know. But here, it was like, it was like, you know, like, they do this zoom in of the bug, and you can see, like, the, like, the, like, water glistening on the bug's back, yeah. and you can hear the, like, as yeah. it like goes into the grate and I was like oh my god that's crazy that I can see that in such detail yeah the in the way that like that's how I felt about the rhino one when I watched the rhino video mm. and I was like I there is no world in which I could ever get this close to a rhino and yeah. see the hairs on the rhino's back well you know what's interesting is that I actually think I have liked the documentary stuff more than the narrative one so far, right? What's documentary? The rhino one? The rhino one, the travel one, the sports ones, right? Those I ones. I haven't seen any of those. That's hard for me to say. I, I've well, only seen, seen the rhino, just the rhino. No, you also said you saw what? one of the, the, the like tightrope one. Oh, the tightrope like, one. Yeah, yeah like, sure, all, sure. All of those are all documentary, okay. right? Okay. Like the only narrative one is this this new one, and I, I don't I can't tell if it's it's because I, I Edward Berger just can't get me invested in a story. Sorry, Edward. <laughs> You're a great filmmaker. <laughs> I know you're watching. <laughs> but, or whether it's because um, it's still very nascent, right? Like, I'm not saying that I want it to be like a stage play. There are great things about stage plays. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that I want it to be like film. There are great things about film. You think it's obviously. a new frontier? It is a combination of the two. And I bet you the language will start to kind of overlap in a lot more ways than we realize. And I wonder what that is going to lead to when it comes yeah. to narrative filmmaking, right? Like, people are still innovating when it comes to films themselves, right? Like, in the way that we use special effects, in the way that we use, like, uh, framing, in the way that we use frame rate, and mm -hmm. things like that, and the way that animation works. Like, think about an animated film in there. That'd be really cool, right? Oh my gosh. Yeah. Well, yeah. actually, I don't know. I think, I can't imagine an animated film. Like, imagine, like, the uh, Spider-Verse. Oh, yeah. That would be oh, so cool. Oh, totally. Right? I can imagine one like that. It's hard for me to imagine, like, like Studio Ghibli, for example, because it's I like- I think it'd be awesome. It would be very cool, yeah. but it would not, like, I think that the biggest thing that I admire about watching these things in Apple Vision is that it's like the amount, it's like, like I said, you, you feel superhuman yeah. in that like the amount of detail is like almost beyond a human eye or it's like as good as a human eye, yeah. if not better. Which is why I think I like the documentary stuff, is because it feels very real, right? And so immediately yeah. putting me into something that's fake and not having the language of that figured out made me kind of made it kind of fall flat for me. Like, yeah, yeah. I don't know, but you saw how into it I was too. Like and when I, he was trying to close, so like yeah. the, the the water's rushing into the ship, yeah. and he's trying to close this thing, like. And, and I talk during movies normally, anyway, <laughs> so like it's not like I would have not reacted, but like there was a there was a level of disengagement that I I mean it's like all all quite on the Western Front. Like you know, you're watching them get. You know, we watched our main character. I'm sorry if I'm spoiling this for somebody who hasn't seen it. You watch the main character get stabbed through the chest, <laughs> right, from behind, and like, I don't think either of us even reacted. We were like, oh, like, granted, we'd seen like a ton of death at yeah. that point, so like, it wasn't like new. Yeah. But like, we were like, oh, that Which sucks. Which may have been That's the sad. point of the movie. <laughs> no, it's like, it's almost like <laughs> war desensitizes. Edward Berger, come on the show. I know exactly. We're like Edward Berger. Um, no, but but it's like, okay, maybe it's better to say like something that happened earlier in the on, earlier on in in that movie. But I mean, we had this whole movie full of things that had happened. I feel like the most engaged was maybe when they were they were stealing the eggs and the goose, and they were like running out, and yeah. we were like. For some reason, that felt more high stakes than like when they were in the actual <laughs> yeah. active combat. I also think that was intentional too, by the way. I think yeah. so too, yeah. um, and definitely felt like foreshadowing for <laughs> the end. Um, but 
I did not feel as engaged in that way. Whereas like when I was watching Submerged and, yeah. and like he wasn't even dying. It was just like he was trying to close this like this like hatch thing that ha that was like all the water was coming. But like I felt like I was there. Like I felt like I should reach out and try to close <laughs> this thing with him. And you heard me yelling. I like, don't know if you got it on video. I but, didn't, but I was like I was like why is Somebody nobody help helping him. this man? <laughs> Somebody help this guy. And I'm like, like I'm in the room, yeah. but I don't have hands. Like it's I'm stuck. It's kind of like a dream in that way. Where it like felt some, like a dream. Where sometimes like you, you don't dream, have you control can't, over yeah. your body, yeah. and you have kind of control over your vision. Like yeah. sometimes you're like, wait a minute, what's happening here? And then other times you're just like, uh, like they're taking me on this adventure, and I'm going through it. But I literally was like, oh my god, like it felt yeah. like a nightmare that I was stuck in, where I was like, I, I want to help you. And then at some point I was like, just get out of here, yeah. like, just run, yeah. and like. And like when they when they they had to like they had to like let the water rise and then like ho hold their breath and swim and I like felt like I should be holding my breath in that moment because yeah. it was so immersive. Yeah. Whereas like in the other movie it was like they're running through the battlefield and he's getting shot at and like I you know I didn't want him to die so I'm like oh you know don't get shot but like I was not that engaged in it. Yeah. It makes Which me... of course of course you're not gonna be as Im immersed in well, something like... that's not taking up your entire field of vision and. As we round Designed things out that. here, I think that like the thing that I would say that is is a difference between mediums, right? We talk a lot about medium being the message, right? And I've got my contentions with that phrase and things like that, but I think that there is some truth to it, right? Like a medium itself affects what stories can be told and what messages can be carried across it, across it, right? So, theater has is a certain medium and mm -hmm. it can carry certain messages in a certain way. Yeah. Film is a medium and it can carry messages in a certain way. For example, a difference between theater and film is that film can play with time. Editing is just manipulation of time, right? Where, and so that's true in this. Like you can manipulate time. We cut from one scene and it jumps to another thing where you shorten a sequence such that oh, you go you know. somewhere really quickly. But in theater, you can't do that. And so this is kind of that weird mix between them, right? But what were you gonna say? Well, I'm just thinking about your, your thing about time. I remember actually being very disoriented while watching the tightrope one, mm -hmm. where it's like she's oh, walking yeah. on the tightrope and then they like, I think that they cut to like the next day yeah. at one point. Like it was like, oh, she, she tried to do it and then she like didn't think she was gonna succeed that day and so she like went back and had to like wrestle her demons and then like yeah. go back and try again the next day. And I remember being like, wait a minute. <laughs> like I was like, I was disoriented. Yeah. Cause we were like, we were on the tightrope with her. Yeah. We were there and then we weren't anymore and she was in her tent and I was like, huh? And maybe I'm misremembering it. I, I don't really know. Well, but I remember, yeah. I, I, what I remember was being like, Wait, did she finish the tightrope? Because like, how did we get back? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, it felt like we should have almost walked back with her and done all of it in mostly real time. Yeah. I mean, I, th I think that you know the idea of a film as like a moving picture, that phrase "moving picture" is very accurate, right? It's actually yeah. a very good description of what film is. Yeah. It's like a photo. A photo is like something physical, and maybe it evokes a memory. Like it helps you like remember something, right? Mm -hmm. But you are kind of conjuring most of that. Yeah. This is much more like a director can teleport you somewhere, mm -hmm. and they can make you travel in time. Right, mm -hmm. which is sort of fascinating, right? Whether that be teleporting you to an entirely fictional story, or teleporting you to that tightrope scene, or teleporting you to the Super Bowl, right? Mm -hmm. And it makes you cut between those sequences in ways that yeah. you is not is not possible in theater, yeah. right? And so that is something that we've never really had, I don't think, in this type of way. And it sounds like for you, you really enjoy that type of immersion, maybe because you really don't have any other choice than to be immersed in it. Like it's that dream effect where you have to pay attention or you have to stop watching, basically, right? Yeah. Whereas in a movie, you've got other, you got your phone, you got other things, you got these distractions, right? Yeah. If you, and it's like, that's one reason why people like to go to theaters, right? It's because yeah. it's like the only thing that's in front of you, it's this big gigantic screen, it, it captures your attention in that way. And whereas for me, I enjoyed it, but for whatever reason, it didn't hook me in the same way in the narrative sense. And I can't necessarily pinpoint why. So I don't know, I'm, as we, again, as we close out, I wonder, that sounds like, well, you rate it out of five. Why would you give it out of five and why? Submerged? Yeah. Um, well, just the, the actual content of it felt anticlimactic to me. Sure. Like it was like, you know, you're like, there was like so much suspense. It felt like one scene out of something that should have been a larger it movie. It should have been a yeah. larger movie. Yeah, it yeah. was like, and that's what I'm saying is that it felt like a short where it was like they were just like oh, yeah, totally trying to was. encapsulate it in such a short amount of time. It's yeah. like 15 minutes. Um, yeah, so I would, I'm trying to imagine that. Like, for me. Because the, the actual yeah. plot, like, here's the thing when it came to like it being an actual movie, there was a lot less there, right? And we know that it's not a director thing because it, it was Edward Berger either for way. For both of them, yeah. 
But in the other one, it was like there was really developed and complex characters, yeah. and there was you know was symbolism. Go, actually, there yeah. was like they you know like oh, the, the 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 motif, the like continual motif of the shared items, yeah. right? Like the clothing yeah, and yeah. the pictures, and yeah. there's these are things and that the like, mechanization like that we like about, it was like the tanks. They, these were the humanizing moments. They, like it felt like he was really trying to humanize war yeah. in that way, right? And so, you know, like. There wasn't really a lot of that. There was maybe there was one picture that was shared between the two men, and the, so we had a little bit of that actually. So it was a good movie to compare it to. There mm-hmm. was like one, there was like the photo, and then the man is like, yeah. "I need my photo of my sister," right? Yeah. And like he loses it in the in the flood of the submarine. But there wasn't enough of that to the degree that I was like, "Oh, this yeah. is this is like." It, it, there wasn't enough like circular storytelling, and there wasn't, you know what I mean, like the things that I really value. And I wonder in a movie. if that's a function of the length of the of the film, I think or it was why that. that's a function of the medium. Um, that's a good question. I, I would say, I, I think that it's probably mostly a function of the length of it, um, that they were not doing a full feature production. I mean, that was all quite on the Western Front was like what three hours long <laughs> almost and yeah. this was 15 minutes so you just like can't accomplish that amount yeah. in that amount of time yeah, you can't get invested and that's, in characters that's in been that my way. biggest thing with any of the any of the like uh, what's it called uh, the, the, apple the, the apple immersive stuff yeah. is that like all of them are like 15 minutes long and so it's like it's cool but I don't get to like you know get as like I'm I'm immersed because of the medium yeah. but I'm not as immersed because of the content Hmm. And I would like to be immersed for both. Like, it's you funny. know what would be yeah. great? Like, if I could see, you've seen Free Solo, right? Yeah. If I could see Free Solo <laughs> on I Immersive wanna, Apple, oh my don't gosh. Don't get any idea. That would I do be, not want to see Free Solo. Oh my, that would be crazy, <laughs> I would, though. I'd like, be throwing up. <laughs> no, yeah, that's how I felt when we burst into the ocean, and my biggest fear is the ocean. Okay, yeah. Open water. Yeah, and that like, was a beautiful shot, and I'm, too, actually. I, I literally felt like, sh- like a queasy, almost. <laughs> no, and not because I'm, like, seasick, but, like, I'm scared of like sharks and stuff, yeah. and like just you I, were the, literally the idea of like having like like just like kilometers of just emptiness below me is like my the nightmare. Lassophobia. I hate it, and so that to me like the scary. It's like so funny. I was like in the middle of a submerging, sinking submarine, and I was like, "That's fine, I'll drown." But being up on the water on the top of it was like I, was, I literally felt like icky. Like I was like freaked out because it felt like I was in a nightmare. So if I'm getting this right, the so, interesting thing sorry. is that you want a longer yeah. film. It's, it's like you actually enjoy the format so much that you want a longer one. I want Whereas a longer me, one. I'm like, eh, I don't My know eyes, that I would even like is, a longer version you know, of this, right? And so, what would you rate it out of five? <sighs> Well, and you know, I'm saying that, but like my head hurts when I wear the Apple Vision Pro and my eyes get itchy. Well, imagine that those are fixed. But yeah, that's sure. important. That's sure. important. But that's why I'm like, it's hard for me to even imagine watching. That's why I should try to watch an like a normal movie on it. So you would rate it? I would rate it three and a half. Okay. And then what would you rate All Quiet on the Western Front? Uh, out of five? Yeah. Three and a half. <laughs> I'd give them both two, actually. I, I, I thought that All Quiet on the Western Front one, but it's interesting that we are kind of matched across. And I think that for you, it sounds like that, that for the movie, you it really enjoyed the actual storytelling involved in it, right? And the ways that they, like, the, the, some of the messages that were trying to be shared and some of the things, the things that I like. I about like the, the characters more in All Western. Ex- that, yeah, and the, that's what I mean. It's like the character, the character based storytelling and things like that. Yeah. The interesting piece of that is that a lot of those things could be fixed by just lengthening the amount of time in a narrative format for Apple Immersive, right? Like, you could imagine telling All Quiet on the Western Front in Apple Immersive format, right? And it would be shocking. Oh my God, it would be horrifying. <laughs> yeah. You're running down the battlefield with him. <laughs> yeah, basically. You're getting shot at. Yeah. Yeah. And actually, that, that is one of the considerations. I, w- I don't want to go too deep, but like, if you think about a lot of the uh, um, submerged film, like a lot of it was stationary, so you couldn't do a lot of the like sort of same type of action blocking and things like that. Yeah, I'm like, how but do you even do that? For me, know. which is kind of the interesting part of this format, for me, I don't know that making it longer would make it better for me. Hmm. That's the interesting piece of it. Like, I think a longer documentary, I would be super into, but I don't know that I, the narrative uh, format has been proven to me. But I'm also more of a skeptic when it comes to those things. So it depends. Yeah. I would be curious to see more, like a di- like a just totally different type of content. Because even though you're saying like, yes, this was this was narrative instead of documentary, it still felt kind of documentary-ish. No, to me. it's not a documentary. I, it felt like it though because it was just <laughs> it's a contrived it, story well, about it. No, but it, it's a, a contrived a historical, historical yeah. like it, it's historical fiction, right? Which to me yeah. already leans a little bit more in the. I know from a film guy, like you're talking about from like actual film perspective. I'm just saying. What do you mean? Just, well, I just, just felt like I felt like I was in a museum. 
and I was watching this from like I was watch, I was watching a m museum immersive experience of being on this thing. And like yes, there was a story, but it felt like a story in the way that like we put stories into curriculum where it's not really real, but like we want to feel like there is storytelling going on here. But really, I I don't know we're focused mean. on the history of it all. I, I am curious though, in what you uh, would want to see next. Like, what is the next thing that you would want to see? I, if I wanted to actually be able to tell what I felt about narrative, I want to see like Nancy Drew. I want to see like, hmm. you know, like, or like, uh, what's it called? Um, oh, you know, what, Something what, are, those, more genre what are those movies that. that's like a, the, like a, it's, a, it's a murder on the Orient Express, like that kind of, like a mystery or something where like, because I think that would really actually give yeah. to that type of immersive, like you can, like you're basically involved okay. and you're looking for clues, that kind of a thing. It would be more interesting okay, to me yeah. in that way rather than just like where the a story. Where the decision making aspect of the medium would play a deeper role in the story itself is what you're saying, right? And I guess this actually, I'd be curious about that. And yeah. it, it, this does help me understand what you were saying before, which is that this is closer to the documentary format than something that's more stylistic in that way. Like this movie, that, and this is probably true of a lot of Edward Berger, like his, his style, it's not, doesn't have a lot of style to it. It's like very like, it's supposed to be like, you're there. It's supposed to feel real and yeah. things like that. It's not like he's like a Wes Anderson film where it's like very, it feels yeah. very contrived, right? Yeah, you're like, or like okay, a Wes Anderson, but like, I don't think that this, it would make sense with a Wes Anderson film. I'd be I'd I don't love think to see you could do it. Do. I think it'd be really interesting to see, I but I don't think- I think you'd be great at it, actually. I, I think it wouldn't even make sense because the whole thing is that you're wanting to have these like stretched out shots and not these like zoomed in moments. And I feel like Apple Immersive is like zoomed in. She's wrong about that. I don't know. I, I don't think it, it's hard for me to imagine. That's all. 